and welcome to Sips and Stories. My name is Elizabeth and in today's video I will finally be doing my Victober wrap up. So my apologies for posting this video so late. I finally made it home, finally got a chance to edit this footage, but I was in London for most of October and it was such a delight to be in that town, in that city, where most of these books that I read were conceived and written. Just the architecture of the place alone really puts you in that Victober spirit. So grab your favorite beverage as I discuss my Victober wrap up. So the first book that I read during Victober was The Group Pick, Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This is my second Thomas Hardy novel and now I can say for certainty that I love Thomas Hardy. He is fast becoming one of my favorite Victorian writers and this year he kind of outdid Dickens and Trollope which is something I thought would never happen. I never thought I would enjoy a Thomas Hardy novel more than an Anthony Trollope novel but I did this year. The Mayor of Casterbridge is the second Thomas Hardy book that I have ever read. The first of course was Far From the Maddening Crowd and I do recommend that if you are new to Thomas Hardy to start there simply because it is his most famous book. It's very romantic. There's been a lot of movie adaptations of it. So it's an easy way to get into Thomas Hardy and to see if you like his style. So I, of course, loved that book. I love Bathsheba Everdeen. And I thought I was gonna continue with Tess of D'Urbaville. I had every intention of reading that book this year until they picked Mayor of Casterbridge. So I thought, okay, I'll just go ahead and read this one. I did not expect to enjoy it as much as I did. I loved it and now I am certain that Thomas Hardy is one of my favorite Victorian writers and just kind of one of my favorite classic writers in general. He is just the master of multiple different literary things. He's really good at drama, he's really good at comedy, excellent nature writing, and then Thomas Hardy does something unique that not even Dickens or Trollope can do. He just has really good turns of phrases and really good insights into people and human nature. So every few pages, usually at the beginning of his chapters, he has like really good chapter introductions where he just gives you this like really interesting insight into human nature and human psychology. I think that's why I enjoy Thomas Hardy the most, it's just his excellent turns of phrase. If you are new to Mayor of Casterbridge, this book is fascinating. It reminds me a lot if you are a fan of that movie Indecent Proposal that stars Demi Moore and Woody Harrelson and Robert Redford. It's not the same plot as Indecent Proposal, but it kind of explores some of those same themes as that movie. I love that movie, it's really interesting. It is about a man, Michael Henchard, who at the beginning of the book is in his early 20s. He's married, he has a small daughter. One day, him and his family are at this fair and he gets really, really drunk. And he just hates being a husband, he hates being a father. And he just says, you know what? I'll sell my wife and child to the highest bidder. If you want her, take her. What he doesn't expect is that someone takes him up on his offer. There is this sailor that says, sure, I'll buy your wife from you. And the wife is so exasperated with him that she goes off with this other guy and takes their kid. So that is the beginning of the book. That's what really hooked me and probably hooks a lot of readers. The rest of the book is the consequences of that decision. So it fast forwards 20 years, you see what happened to Michael. I won't lie, he is the mayor of Casterbridge. So his life and how he gets really wealthy, so his rise and his fall is the theme of this book. I loved it and it does explore those topics that you know, every decision you make is going to haunt you throughout your life. So make sure that you're making good decisions. Make sure that you aren't hurting people, that you're there for your family and friends because just one thing that you do will have repercussions throughout your life. I love this book and I gave it five out of five stars. It was an excellent start to Victober. This edition too is really special. I got it at McNaughton's in Edinburgh. I'll talk about McNaughton's in my Edinburgh video, so please stay tuned. I'll try to get that one up next, but McNaughton's is a really special bookstore and this really vintage-y edition of Mayor of Casterbridge is so cool. The next book that I read was, of course, an Anthony Trollope novel, and like I just hinted, I really did enjoy Mayor of Casterbridge the most, more than this book, um, which is the fifth installment in the Barsetra Chronicles, and that is The Small House at Arlington. So I love Barsetra Chronicles. I love Anthony Trollope. Again, 
The way I sell him to people is that he is a cross between Charles Dickens and Jane Austen. In this book in particular, The Small House at Arlington, he kind of goes in the Jane Austen direction. In fact, this book almost reminded me of like Anthony Trollope's version of Sense and Sensibility. The plot was almost the same as Sense and Sensibility. So if you like that book, which I won't lie is not my favorite Austen novel, I do think you will like A Small House at Arlington. I didn't love it as much as the other Bar Setcher novels simply because all of my favorite characters were not in it. So um, Dr. Thorne wasn't in it, um, the Grantleys weren't in it, and the Greshams, and then my favorite character, Miss Dunstable, was not in it. So that being said, it was a whole new set of characters, and it was a lot of fun, but again, I didn't love these characters as much as some of those earlier books. It is about the Dale family. So Mrs. Dale is a widow, very similar to Mrs. Dashwood. She has two daughters, um, Lily Dale and Belle Dale. Again, very similar to Marianne and Eleanor. Um, and it's just kind of the same situation as Sense and Sensibility. The Dale sisters are very poor. They don't have an inheritance of their own, but they are allowed to live on their uncle's estate the small house at Arlington, and so they are raised by wealthy people. They are exposed to a wealthy lifestyle. They just don't have any money of their own. So most of this book is about who the two sisters are going to marry. Are they going to marry a poor guy for love or a rich guy that they don't really care about? So that is the theme that Trollope explores in this novel. And I almost wonder if he was purposely trying to rewrite Sense and Sensibility if this was kind of his tongue-in-cheek version of Jane Austen because that's what it feels like. Um, I also got this very special edition at a really cool bookstore. So what happened was while I was in London I knew that The Small House in Arlington was the next book that I wanted to read. So while I went around to all those iconic London bookstores, I'll link that video below, I was purposely looking for a small house at Arlington um, and nobody had it. Foils didn't have it, which I was surprised. Waterstone did not have it. Um, they had Anthony Trollope, just not this book. So one day I took a tour up to Annick Castle and Annick Castle is really, really cool. Um, I highly recommend it as a day trip, probably from Edinburgh. Um, I'm not sure if you can get there from London. I went while I was in Edinburgh, so it's only a couple hours away. It's in Northumberland. It's on the border of Scotland and England. Um, it's really, really cool, really fascinating, and kind of my favorite new place, my favorite castle now in England. So after I was there and explored the grounds of Annick Castle, um, I did go into the town of Annick itself to visit this very iconic bookstore called Barter Books. Barter Books is really special because it is in an old converted train station. It is a used bookstore. I loved it. It had really cool editions of books, including, you guessed it, this copy of The Small House at Arlington by Everyman's Library. And this edition is from the 1960s. So at first you might be thinking, oh, it's from the 30s or the 40s. It's from the 1960s. It's really cool. They did have more books in the Bar Setcher Chronicles. I just could not fit them all in my suitcase, but I'm so happy that I found this edition at Barter Books because it was such a cool bookstore. I loved it and it's now one of my favorite bookstores in the UK. Alrighty, so in addition to Thomas Hardy, another pleasant surprise this Victober was Sherlock Holmes. So I will let you in on a dirty little secret. As much as I love classic books, as much as I love Victorian literature, and as much as I love the mystery genre, I have never read any of the Sherlock Holmes novels. And the reason I never have is because I never know to where to start with Sherlock Holmes. Obviously, I am familiar with his character. I've seen all the movies. I've watched all the TV shows. Yes, I love Benedict Cumberbatch. Who doesn't? Um, but I never really knew where to start with the source material. I also mistakenly thought that it was more dense than what it was. Um, now I understand why you hear people say that they started with Sherlock Holmes when they were 10, because it is really easy to read. Um, so don't be like me and be intimidated with Sherlock Holmes, because now that I've read this first book, A Study in Scarlet, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 
I love these characters, I love his writing style, and I cannot wait to read more in the series. One reason, again, why I never read the series is it's very confusing on where to start. So a lot of people argue about Sherlock Holmes, especially a lot of diehard fans, and they'll tell you to start with the short stories, and then some people will tell you to start with the novels. And when they bring up the novels, they bring up ones like A Hound in Baskerville, where I do think that A Study in Scarlet is the perfect place to start. I found this Penguin Red Edition at a charity shop and I was so excited because it had a number one on it. So thank you for putting a number one on a Sherlock Holmes book because it's telling you where to start. The reason why I think this is the perfect place to start is because this is the story where Sherlock and Dr. Watson meet each other. So Dr. Watson gets back from Afghanistan and he's looking for a place to live. His friend introduces him to Sherlock and they decide to rent an apartment together. You guessed it, at 221B Baker Street. So I loved it and having seen all the TV shows, I do think that modern TV show with Benedict Cumberbatch did a really good job of adapting this book now that I've read it because it was a lot of fun, it was excellent, and it's now one of my favorite mysteries of all time. I really love A Study in Scarlet. I don't know why more people don't talk about this book because it is so great. After I finished it, I did have that same feeling that I had after I finished Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. So I highly recommend it. It is really a mic drop at the end. It's one of those books that you finish and just get like so excited because it's so good. Um, part two is really trippy, so I don't want to spoil part two for anyone that hasn't read this, but it gets really interesting really fast in part two. Love this book and can't wait to read more Sherlock Holmes in the future. So obviously being in London, there are a lot of Sherlock Holmes things to do. My recommendation is just to get off at the Baker Street tube station. Um, when you get off the tube, it's so cool because they have Sherlock Holmes in profile right on the side of the tube station. There are also illustrations from some very iconic scenes in the Sherlock Holmes books, including this one, The Hound of Baskerville. It seems like I always got off on the spot by The Hound of Baskerville. And then you can, of course, visit like I did the Sherlock Holmes Museum. I will say right off the bat, I didn't love this museum. I did think it was kind of a ripoff. It was 16 pounds or $20, but you really didn't get to see anything historical, anything of interest other than just kind of fake Sherlock Holmes sets um, of the living room with the violin and the pipe and things like that. So it was a lot of like wax dummies, Madame Tussaud kind of a vibe in there. I do recommend though that if you just kind of want that selfie in front of 221B Baker Street, you can just walk up to the actor that is playing the police officer, take your selfie, go to the gift shop, and then get out of there. So take my advice and do not pay to go into that museum unless you absolutely have to have that selfie in front of the fireplace with the violin. I don't recommend it. That being said, I did of course visit the bookstore because I paid the 16 pounds. And now that I know that I love Sherlock Holmes, I did buy one of the most iconic books in the series, which is The Hound of Baskerville. And this edition is by Flame Tree Press. Um, one of my favorite publishers, they just publish these really glitzy editions of classic books. This one is quite small, so here it is next to the mass market paperback so you can see how tiny it is. Um, it also has a lot of gold foiling, um, gold deckled edges there, and then a nice gold ribbon bookmark. And then it has a lot of cool illustrations peppered throughout as well. So I do recommend that if you are trying to get into Sherlock Holmes to buy the Flame Tree Press editions because they seem to be everywhere now. So although I was disappointed in the Sherlock Holmes Museum, this next museum was one of my favorite experiences in London, especially if you are a bibliophile like me, and that was the Charles Dickens Museum. I love the Charles Dickens Museum. It was one of my favorite places in London. It was also less crowded than some of the bigger museums. Um, and I think it is the perfect place for a day trip in London, just kind of something easy to do. It is in the neighborhood of Bloomsbury, so it's very close to the British Museum if you are in that area. It's just less crowded than the British Museum and just more cozy and more charming. 
It's also worth the 12 pounds because unlike the Sherlock Holmes Museum, this is an actual real historical site where Charles Dickens lived with his family, where he worked. And Charles Dickens did live throughout London. He had multiple addresses throughout London during his lifetime. This just happens to be the one that they turned into a museum. It's beautifully preserved. And I think if you are with family and friends that are not necessarily bookish like you, I think they will enjoy it too, just for the history of the place, the architecture, and it's in a really nice neighborhood. It also feels just very cozy in there. While I was there, I bumped into to a lot of teachers, a lot of bookish people like me. Kids were on field trips in there and it just was really easy to walk around and browse as small as the house was. It was just kind of easy to walk around. They also had a very nice uh, cafe where you could have, you know, a piece of Victorian sponge cake, which I love, um, and a cup of tea. So just a really nice day trip in and around London. Another reason I loved the Charles Dickens Museum was because it had so much of his personal paraphernalia, such as some of his papers, his writing desk, a lot of his books, which was really interesting. And then also it had multiple editions of all his books as well, which I found fascinating just to see all those different editions of The Christmas Carol, of Great Expectations, of David Copperfield, things like that. One of the cool things that was there while I was there was this edition of A Cricket on the Hearth, um, which was the first edition that he kind of wrote in the flyleaf as a gift to his friend Hans Christian Andersen. So I thought that was so fascinating that Charles Dickens and Hans Christian Andersen were friends. I didn't even realize that they were actually contemporaries until now. Um, and it's just kind of cool to see that Charles Dickens sent one of his books to Hans Christian Andersen. Wow, how cool is that? So again, I love this place. It was fascinating. Also, while I was there, they were doing a special exhibit dedicated to Charles Dickens and ghost stories. And as you know, if you read any Dickens, he was fascinated with death. He does tend to love ghost stories, even his most heartwarming book, a Christmas Carol is technically a ghost story. Um, and so the exhibit was really cool. It went into all of that. And that's what I bought in the gift shop because I'm sorry, I just not did not have time this month to read a full length Charles Dickens novel. So I was quite happy to read some Charles Dickens short stories. This is the Penguin Black copy of To Be Read at Dusk. It's number 86 in the series, if you're curious. I love these editions. They're really cool because they fit into your purse. They're perfect to read on the train or on the tube or on the bus. So it was coming in, hand, in handy in that respect. Um, and again, I didn't realize what a good short story writer that Charles Dickens was. I knew he was a great novelist, but now I'd like to explore more of his short stories because I really enjoyed this. Um, especially there is one story called The Signal Man. It's about a railroad signal man who keeps seeing the same ghost. And after he sees the ghost, there are all these train accidents that happen. And I love that story. I thought it was excellent. I think if you are a fan of things like The Twilight Zone, you will really enjoy The Signal Man. So I kind of finished that one over uh, Halloween. So it's just a nice story to read during Halloween. Again, love Charles Dickens and the Dickens House, the Dickens Museum is the perfect place to visit on your next trip. London. So wrapping things up, no discussion of October is complete without some mention of the Brontes. And I've been very fortunate to read a new Bronte book every year during October. I've kind of run out of the Bronte books now. And this latest one that I read this year was Agnes Grey by my favorite Bronte, Anne Bronte. Last year I did read Tenant of Walfell Hall. I love that book. It is one of my favorite Bronte books. I gushed about it. Um, but Agnes Grey was so sweet and so charming as well. It was just, it was a different side of Anne Bronte. It wasn't as controversial as Tenant of Walfell Hall, not as groundbreaking. I do think that is the better novel, but this one was great. I like to think of Agnes Grey as just kind of a tamer version of Jane Eyre. Um, it explores many of the same themes like a governess and it has a light romance to it. It also has a little snarkiness to it as well. I mean, Anne Bronte says it like it is. And in this book, it is about a young woman named Agnes Grey, whose family has fallen on hard times. 
So she decides to kind of contract herself out as a governess to help her family. So she is not an orphan like Jane Eyre. She has a mother, she has a sister. She just kind of wants to go out to work as a governess to kind of help out around the house basically and gain some independence. But while she goes to these houses with all these rich people and starts tutoring these kids, she realizes how different her life is from these very wealthy people and just how superficial that they are. Um, I think that if you've ever been a teacher, you will probably relate to Agnes Gray. Um, there were just a lot of situations that have not changed in the last 100, 150 years. Um, just kind of having to bite your tongue when you're around the parents. Um, of course, right, parents think their kids are perfect little angels, but when you're a teacher, they can just be crazy, anything but. So Agnes Gray does explore those themes, kind of the hypocrisy in some of these households. And it's very autobiographical. I do think it is one of the most autobiographical of all the Bronte novels. It is about a parson's daughter, um, all the Bronte sisters, of course. Their father was a parson. It is about her being a governess. All of the Bronte sisters, maybe Emily didn't, I'm not sure, but they all were contracted as governesses, I believe, especially Charlotte and Anne. So again, this is just a nice take on the Bronte experience, on the Victorian lifestyle. And it is light too, guys. It's probably the easiest Bronte novel to read. It's a good one for teenagers to read. So I highly recommend it if you just kind of want to break into the Brontes, even before diving into something like Wuthering Heights or Jane Eyre. I love this book. I gave it five out of five stars. And the reason I don't have the physical book with me is I mailed it home to myself. So I did read the Faber edition of Agnes Grey, which I found at Foils. It's a lovely edition. I highly recommend it. Very inexpensive, but just kind of a really pretty edition of Agnes Gray. Loved it. I also had one other Bronte experience uh, this October. Um, if you're in the US, you it's not out yet, but if you are in the UK, you know what I'm talking about. They just came out with the Emily movie starring Emma McKay and it was directed and written by Francis O'Connor. And I, guys, I thought it was excellent. Um, I loved it, not historically accurate. I think historians are gonna have a field day with this one, but it was so cool. I just love the take that Francis O'Connor had on Emily Bronte. It was so good, it almost made me wanna reread Wuthering Heights. And I hate Wuthering Heights, as you know. Um, basically, it's just kind of exploring like what Emily Bronte might have been like based on her books because she was so sensationalist, because she was so passionate and romantic and just all around crazy. The movie kind of explores like a fictional version of what Emily Bronte might have been like. And I thought Emma McKay did such a fantastic job. She is so stunning and just her presence um, on screen was amazing as Emily Bronte. It gets into like maybe Emily Bronte had a romance. Maybe that's why she was such a passionate writer. So I did like that part of the movie and I think that's where historians are just going to have a field day because there is no evidence that Emily Bronte was having an affair with her father's curate. That being said, it was a great movie. I also like that it did have some compassion for Branwell. I've always been a person that hated Branwell. Um, I just always thought he was a drunkard and that he just forced the Bronte sisters to earn money to become governesses because he was so selfish and cruel to the sisters. But this movie kind of explores that poor Bramwell like didn't know whether he was coming or going. Like maybe he knew that his sisters were geniuses and then maybe that just kind of turned him into a drunk. So it does explore that maybe Branwell and Emily were the most misunderstood of the Bronte children. And I really just did like that relationship between Emily and, and Branwell in the movie. There is a very cool scene where they both are taking opium out on the moors and the music gets really interesting. So again, I love this movie. I would see it again if it comes to America, which I think it's coming to the US next year in the spring. Loved it. And again, just a great Bronte experience during Victober. And again, almost, almost makes me want to reread Withering Heights. So there you have it, everyone. Thank you for joining me for my Victober wrap up. Again, I had such a great Victober. It was really special reading all this Victorian literature. 
in England, in London, in the place again where most of it was conceived and written. There is something really special about reading these books in the morning with your cup of tea and then going outside into the city where all these iconic sites are and now the street names are making sense and things like that. So loved it, love London, and especially love Victorian literature. Thank you everyone and have a great day.